Now, what would we call benzene if we're treating it like a substituent? We've actually already learned what the name is for benzene when we're treating it as a substituent. Uh, phenol? That's right. And we call it a phenol substituent. Actually, uh, I don't know. Maybe uh, phenol is more like, I always called it phenol, but I don't know whether it's a short E or a long E. So phenol or phenol. In fact, I think we've already talked about how when you're doing the mechanism, it's helpful to abbreviate the benzene ring as just pH. Mm -hmm. That way you don't have to keep writing it out over and over. So we've already been using this idea that a benzene substituent is a phenyl group. However, a different situation is when you have a benzene and then a CH2 group as a substituent. First the benzene and then a CH2 group as a substituent. Now it turns out that there's a name for that as well. This is called benzyl. that this doesn't seem all that logical. In a way, this seems more like benzene. It seems like this should be called benzyl. Mm -hmm. uh, but anyway, historically, the way it's worked out is, for whatever reason, benzene by itself as a substituent is called phenyl, and benzene plus a CH2 group is called benzyl. And again, we just have to make flashcards and memorize that. So for example, a good common name for this compound would be phenyl alcohol. Mm -hmm. But would be a good common name for this compound, benzyl alcohol. Because here the alcohol isn't on the benzene ring, it's on the CH2 that's connected to the benzene ring. Okay. So this is a good example of the difference between phenyl and benzyl. Phenyl alcohol versus benzyl alcohol. Those wouldn't be the IUPAC names in any case, but that would illustrate some common naming that we could use here. Incidentally, we said that in condensed notation we would write a phenyl group like this. Your instructor mentioned that in condensed notation you would write a benzyl group like this, BN. Although maybe I should have skipped that because I don't actually see that come up very much. So let's go back to IUPAC naming. Let's try to come up with a reasonable IUPAC name here. I might have some trouble with this, but just, just take a reasonable guess, and we'll see how we do. Let's try to take a guess as to what a reasonable name would be for this compound. steps there. Now first of all, what type of functional group? So one thing we have to do is we have to decide who we're going to treat as the main chain and who we're going to treat as the substituent. And it sounded like you were treating this as the main chain as this as the substituent. Uh, and that's what they did in the lecture notes as well. Although, uh, like I said, I guess that, that makes things simpler to treat this as the main chain. Now, how, uh, let's see here then, how many carbons do we have in the main chain? One, two, three, four, five. So that pent sounds like a good idea. There's no double bonds, that's pentan. Now, what type of functional group do we have here? A ketone. A ketone, that's right. I think pentano. Pentano, that's right. I think a second ago you were thinking of this as an aldehyde, but that would be if there was a hydrogen. I knew it was a ketone, I just right. had the wrong suffix. There you go. Yeah. So ketone ends in O and E, and so does the suffix. That would give us a pentanone. So what would be the full name now? Uh, Phenylpentanone. We have to give indication by number on this particular thing? Yeah, we do. Okay. By one phenol. It's good that you thought about that. That's right, because after all, the phenyl group could have been on any of the carbons. So we have to say which carbon it's on. All right. And we've already discussed that a benzene ring that's treated as a substituent is called phenyl. So this would give us one phenyl pentanone. That's a, a pretty common type of nomenclature problem like you might see on the test. All right. So the key thing was to get the right suffix by identifying the functional group, a ketone, not an aldehyde.
Now the first thing we'll have to do is decide who we're treating as the parent and who we're treating as the substituent. And uh, in this case, they decided to treat this as the parent. And they treated this as the substituent. Like I said, I'm not really sure how, how you, um, what the, the rule is for deciding that, but uh, maybe we do get a slightly simpler name if we treat this as the main chain, although I was never quite clear how to do that. But let's just assume we're going to treat this as the main chain. So let's start by just naming the main chain. What, would, what name would you give to the parent chain here? Butanone. Good. Here we have another ketone. Bute and own. Hmm. Let's back up for a second. We, for, we forgot something up here. We said where the phenyl group was, mm -hmm. but we didn't say where the ketone group was. Mm -hmm. After all, the ketone group could have been here or here. One phenyl, one pentanol. That's right. You don't need to. Oh, again. For an aldehyde, you don't need to say where the aldehyde group is because that's on the number one carbon by definition. But a ketone can be anywhere on the internal carbons, so there we need to locate for that too. Okay, so let's go back and uh, spiff up our name here. What would be a, a better name then for this parent chain? Uh, two butanone. Good. It's always a good idea to give numbers to the parent chain. Mm -hmm. And one thing that's good here is that you're not counting this as part of the parent chain. This carbon isn't part of the parent chain, this is part of the substituent. So this is not pentanone, as he said, it's butanone. So that gives us two butanone. Good. All right, and now we have a kind of complicated substituent over here. So let's go through that together. Uh, so um, we're going to have to give a name to this uh, substituent here. Well, we've got a benzene ring. What, what do we call a benzene ring as a substituent? However, the problem here is that the substituent has its own substituent. So now we're getting into difficult nomenclature. This substituent has its own substituent, and we need to give a name to that. What, what type of functional group do we have out here? An ether. An ether, that's right. That's one of the types of nomenclature that people are most likely to forget. Uh, oftentimes people forget the nomenclature for ethers. Um, but the basic nomenclature for ethers is, first of all, ethers don't get suffixes, they just get prefixes. Okay. And the basic, uh, so the nomenclature here would just be, well, uh, how many carbons are there on this substituent? On this substituent? One. And what's the root for one carbon, the IUPAC root? Meth. Good. So this would be called methoxy. Methoxy, okay. And I think you had mentioned that earlier. Yeah, at some point we did go over ether yeah. uh, nomenclature. I notice people tend to forget that. But the nomenclature for ethers is just alkoxy. Okay. In this case, it would be methoxy. So we would call this methoxy phenyl okay. to show that the phenyl group has its own methoxy substituent. Uh, methoxy four phenyl? Ah, so you're right that we're going to need to say that this whole substituent is on the number four carbon. So okay. we want to say four methoxy phenyl okay. to show that it's on, you, you, you're saying four because this carbon is number four? Mm -hmm. That's right. And there's another locator we need, too, because we need to say where the methoxy group is on the benzene, because it could have been in any of these places. Do you start over with numbers on the substituent? Right, we okay. start all over. And we assume that it's connected by the number one carbon. Episode. That's very important. That's right. The carbon that's connected to the parent chain is always the number one carbon in the substituent. Okay. The carbon that's connected to the main chain is always the number one carbon in the substituent. So then what number would this end up with? Well, we go uh, counterclockwise, mm -hmm. and it would end up with a three. That's right. Why do we go counterclockwise to give this the lowest possible number? We want to give the substituents the lowest possible number. So if we start our numbering all over again, it would go like this. One, two, three. So here's our full name. Four, three methoxyphenyl, two butanone. Notice that we have two different types of locators here. By the way, uh, a useful name for these numbers is a locator. A number that you use in, in IUPAC nomenclature is called a locator because it tells us the location of the substituent. But we have two different types of locators here. Some of our locators are giving us locations on the parent chain, and some of the locators are giving us positions on the substituent. For example, this is giving us a location on the parent chain. This is referring to this carbon in the parent chain. And this is giving us a location on the parent chain. This is referring to this location in the parent chain. 
but this locator is giving us a location on the substituent. This is giving us a whole new set of numbers over here. Well, notice the convention. You put locators that, for a, that are for, when you need a locator for a substituent, you put the substituent in parentheses. Because this name is already very complicated, but this makes it a little less complicated. Someone can look at this and see, aha, numbers outside the parenthesis refer to locations on the parent chain, and this number inside the parenthesis refers to the location on the substituent. So we have to put in this parenthesis here. So anytime you need a locator for your substituent, you should put that substituent in parentheses. Okay.